Well, good morning. It's really good to see everybody out. Last week, after I finished my lesson, Art came up to me, and he said, it was a good sermon, but not a great sermon. And I tell you, and I say that, and I haven't been here long, but Art and I already have a good relationship where we can tease each other about things like that. But it's good to actually hear that in person, not over a text. It's good to be back and see people's faces, even if they're covered up with a mask. It is so good to be back. It's an encouragement to be here this morning. As Paul mentioned in the announcements, we do have some that are visiting with us, and it's really glad, we're really glad that you've chosen to be here. Some from the community, some that are a family of our members here, and we are just delighted that you're here with us. I'd ask that you take out your Bible and um, be following along as we're going to be studying from the Word of God this morning. Typically, I like to have a passage and kind of camp out there and stay in one text, but that's not going to be the case this morning. We are going to be jumping around to a num number of passages and going at a rather quick pace. So I'd ask that uh, you have your Bibles out and be following along with me. But as we begin, I want you to search through your mind, and I want you to find the person that you adore most. F find the person that maybe means the most to you, somebody that you think of and you just, you adore them and you have great and fond memories of. Maybe it's that sweet elderly lady at the church you grew up going to that would always pinch your cheeks or give you a hug. Maybe it was a family friend that felt more like family. I'm sure we all have somebody that we can think of like that. For, for me, it was a gospel preacher that I had the privilege of working with. I'm not going to say his name, because if I did, some of you might know him. Actually, I know some of you do. But you might be surprised, because on the outside, he looks like a harsh man, but he was so loving. He would tease me, but he would be compassionate. He would correct me, and yet he would hug me when I needed it most. And we all have people like that, you know, but I want you to think about that person, how they carried themselves, how they made you feel, how they treated you. And we're going to come back to that person in just a second. But can you turn your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we've nicknamed this chapter the chapter of love. And it has a lot to say about love. How love behaves and what love truly is. And he begins in verse 4, Paul writes here, he says, Love is patient and love is kind. And the list goes on to give us a lifelong challenge of how love behaves and how we in turn need to exhibit love in our lives and how we don't need to display love. But I'm going to stop right there because the word that we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this morning we've already covered, and that's the word kind, that love is kind. Love is good. Love is favorable. That's really what that word is describing, kindness. And it's probably one of the most overlooked and maybe underappreciated words in our New Testament when we think about virtues that we have to possess as New Testament Christians. And I think the reason for that is because it's, well, it's such a generic word. It's such an overused word in our society today. Everything's kind. Everybody's kind. And suddenly we stop to fail to see the significance of what this word means. That it's a foundational word for how God's people behave themselves. This word for kindness is translated several ways throughout our New Testaments, and that will vary depending on the translation that you're using. In some cases, it is d defined or translated as kindness, or benevolence, or goodness. And those are all three the same Greek word that it uh, is used to describe. But it's a word that's closely related for mercy. One author said you can't talk about kindness without the word mercy. Th those two have to go together. But the idea of kindness is that it's desirable. It's useful. It doesn't cause, it doesn't give any type of pain. For instance, remember in Matthew chapter 11, we, we typically read verses 28 through 30, uh, and we call this the invitation of Jesus, where he invites people to him, where he says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and he'll give rest. But notice in verse 30 where Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That word easy is the same Greek word for kindness. It's the idea that it doesn't cause pain. It makes life pleasant. It makes it enjoyable. And that's the idea of kindness and a trait that we need to have. When you are kind, it means that you're pleasant to be around. Remember that person that I asked you to think about earlier? 
from what I've just been describing and how kindness behaves and what, what kindness is, I'm sure that person that, that you just adore, that person you look up to in many ways, you thought I was probably describing them. Because they exhibit kindness in how they present themselves to others. You enjoy being around them. And yet, for some, that's hardly the case. And so a kind-hearted soul is loving. They're, they're gentle, even when times when correction and discipline are needed. Because let's face it, life gets difficult. Life gets messy, and there's times where we have to say things that are uncomfortable. But even in those times, we still need to do that with an attitude of kindness. You know, to be benevolent, to be kind, to be good, those are common words in our society, but th this needs to be one of the chief uh, principles that we live our life by. Why? Because this word is so many times used in our Bibles to describe who God is. When this word kindness is used in our New Testaments, and really the Old Testament as well, when it's applied to a person, it is applied to God more than any other person. And so this, this is the trait that God describes himself by, that he is kindness, and that's the model, that's the example that we are striving after in our lives. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, and then we'll go quickly over to Titus chapter 3 right after that. Paul in this chapter is writing about how we're saved by grace through faith. Reminding us that God's grace in and of itself, that, that is a gift of God's kindness. That is an expression of God's kindness that we can see, that we can know about. And this text goes on in the whole uh, first ten verses, really, of Ephesians 2. It talks about that our God, he is rich. Not, not in the monetary sense of, you know, cash or gold or things like that, but, but he is rich and abundant in mercy. And in verse 7, Paul says this about God, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God's grace, God's kindness, it is visible to us through the cross in the sending of his son to die for the forgiveness of our sins. And so it's in the cross that we see in a drastic way the goodness of our God. I couldn't help but think about that as San was reading those passages this morning before the Lord's Supper as Jesus is surrounded by his enemies going to the cross. And he posed the question, why would he do that? And the answer is also that we see the goodness of God. Titus chapter 3 and verses 4 through 7 gives us another snapshot of God's grace, of God's kindness. Where it says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The fact that we can be saved in spite of our sins, in spite of my failures and my shortcomings, is a perfect picture of the kindness and the mercy of our God. And there are so many other passages in the New Testament that point out the kindness of God. But also what we see in the New Testament is that we as New Testament Christians, as followers and disciples of Jesus trying to be like him, we have to be a people that are kind as well. Ephesians 4 and verse 32 says it very simply for us. And oftentimes we use this passage in where it begins, where it says, be kind to one another. And we apply that, you know, with other Christians. It's much more generic than that. Be kind to everyone. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, tender forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And that is a much needed message today. Be kind to one another. Meaning that you're considerate. You take in the mind how somebody else feels and how you present yourself to them. And similarly, Colossians 3 and verse 12. In a, much, uh, in a very, uh, almost a mirroring type passage, Colossians 3 and verse 12 says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. That we have to put on a lot of traits as Christians. And one of those that is very important, a virtue that we must possess as God's people, is that of kindness. 
that our actions are shaped by the intent of our heart. And so when we are kind, we will be motivated to do good to all that we come in contact with. But I think before you showed up this morning, you probably, maybe you saw the handout last night. Some of you have said you enjoy looking at that, getting a little preview of what's coming. You probably said, okay, kindness, great. We, we know what that is. We, we understand that we need, we need to live it in our lives. But, but are you kind? Is Art kind? Don't answer that. Is Randy kind? Is PJ kind? Are you a kind person? We have, to, we have to ask ourselves that question, I, because I thought growing up that the kind people were just the little old sweet lady at the congregation, that she was kind and everybody else was working toward it. But then we look at these passages, and we see how it is used to describe God and all these other passages, and what I realize, I have to be kind. I have to imitate my Savior and be kind in how I display myself in this world. Kindness is a big deal to God, which means it needs to be the me. Passage, it's not on your uh, handout, not on the PowerPoint. Galatians 5, 22 through 23, remember that? The fruit of the Spirit, that kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a trait that Paul described his, uh, displayed in his ministry in what he says in First and Second Corinthians. Kindness is a, a trait that summarizes Christ coming to this earth and giving his life on the cross. It is the way that God, one of the ways that God chooses to describe himself. It's a virtue that you and I have been called to live, to be a kind people. But this isn't going to be a sermon on kindness. This is the alternative to what we're going to talk about. This is what I hope we live by, what we put into practice. But we're, we're not really actually going to talk about kindness for the rest of our time. I want to talk about what happens when we fail to be kind. What happens when we fail to be the type of people that seeks the good in others and the good in ourselves and how we live our lives? What happens when I don't have a gentle spirit, but rather I have a harsh spirit? I have a critical spirit toward those in my life and those that I come into contact with. I believe that there's a great antonym for the word kindness, and that is what we're going to talk about this morning. That is pettiness. I left that title off your handout for a reason. I didn't want you to think I was being petty about preaching a lesson on pettiness. This word is something that I think we struggle with when we look into what this word means and what we're going to talk about for the remainder of our time this morning. While this word is not translated in our English Bibles, the principles surrounding this word and, and what pettiness is and how it behaves most certainly is. Brethren, we will be far away from the virtue of kindness if we have a mean-spirited concentration on the faults and the errors of others in our lives. Pettiness, nitpicking, fault-finding, I don't care what you call it as long as you see it for what it is. It is the idea of something that is contrary to kindness and what Christians are to put on. It is more than just simply having a bad attitude. It often manifests itself as a behavior which makes pettiness a sin that we must rid from our lives. And so what, what is pettiness? Maybe that's not a word we use too much. Maybe that's something somebody's called you and you say, well, I'm not, I'm not petty. Pettiness is defined as having undue concern with trivial matters, especially of a spiteful nature. Merriam-Webster puts it this way and says that pettiness is having secondary rank having little or no importance. And so petty problems, petty issues are those second-rate things, the, the type of person that majors in the minors. They make a mountain out of a molehill. They can't sweat the small stuff, and guess what? They're going to let you know about it because it just bothers them so much. And whereas the good person is pleasant, you enjoy being around them. You think about somebody that's petty, they're probably the person that you avoid. The person you don't want to be around, the person that creates a toxic environment, maybe at your work, maybe even at your home, maybe even in the Lord's church. Petty people are rude. They are critical. They are condescending. They're the people that like to make a big deal out of nothing. One of my favorite phrases that I found associated with pettiness and researching uh, different uh, words for this lesson is the, the idea of being small-minded. 
That's, that's who somebody that, that, uh, who is petty. That's how they behave themselves. They're, they're small-minded, meaning they can't step back and see the big picture because all the little things, all the minor issues, that's what bothers them. That's what gets under their skins. And of course, they have to let you know about it. But one thing we need to clarify up front when we're talking about pettiness, let's say somebody corrects you for a behavior in your life that's sinful. What if I have to get up and the elders ask me to preach on a lesson that's needed or, or they, have, they come to you and they present something that, that is amiss in your life? Are they being petty for that? Not at all. When somebody confronts you about sin in your life, that is not petty. Sin is not a trivial matter. It is not a minor matter at all. Sin separates us from God. And so when we're dealing with sin in our life, that's not petty. Not at all. And so that's an important thing I want us to clarify before moving on. You know, I think our knee-jerk reaction is when we hear about pettiness and that this is what we're going to shift gears and talk about. I, I think what we oftentimes think, what we oftentimes assume is, well, I'm not petty. I heard what you just defined as pettiness, and that's not me. That's, that's not how I live my life. Well, of course that's what you're going to say. That's what I'm going to say. We always have a good image of ourselves, but is that what your, bo- your boss would say? Is that what your coworkers would say? Is that what your spouse would say? Your family would say? How do you handle the issues and the problems that come up in your life? Do you handle them with grace and with kindness? Or do you maybe revert to pettiness? Consider some examples with me. Maybe somebody, even though you've told them time after time, they left the light on in the closet. And you've just, you've had enough. And so it's going to end tonight. And you let them have it. They can't keep leaving the lights on. Or somebody had the audacity to move your Bible from your spot. And don't even get me started if somebody takes our spot. I mean, you know, what what about, well, my friend, they they didn't smile at me like normal, so I don't don't know why they just, they hate me so much right now. What's going on with them? What did I do to them? You might say these are a little bit dramatic. Yeah, that's oftentimes goes hand in hand with pettiness. Or what about, and this is maybe more for the younger generation, I can't believe they left me on red. Do I, do I have to send them another text message to get them to respond? Why, why won't they respond? What's going on that's so important with their time? Or my spouse said that I look stressed today. Why would they say that I look stressed? Just for that, I'm, I'm going to avoid them until they apologize. You know, the list, that was kind of fun to come up with, some different excuses. I mean, some different examples. But the list could go on and on and on and on of ways that we are petty in dealing with others in our life. But I think when we take a step back and we start to look at maybe the fights that we get into or the times that we become critical toward others, chances are they revolve around these petty, these minor, these second-rate issues that come up in our life. That pettiness is the opposite of kindness. Where kindness is good and pleasant and free of pain and trouble, pettiness is a type of person that brings the troubles right with them. It's a type of person you don't want to be around. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, this is a very helpful passage that tells us why we need to abstain, why we need to rid pettiness from our hearts and rid it from our lives. Pettiness, it shows a lack of patience and gentleness, which is vital if you want to try and get along with other humans, which we just, we, let's face it, we have to do. Ephesians 4, verses 2 through 3, it says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Some of you might recognize and remember this passage. We talked about it two weeks ago in a lesson, three weeks ago now, in a lesson on unity. In talking about the attitudes that we need to put on as Christians if we want to help maintain or create an environment of unity. But notice what isn't on that list. Pettiness is nowhere to be found. But when it gets into our hearts, it comes with oftentimes destructive results. That where pettiness resides, relationships will slowly but surely erode. Husbands and wives who pick at each other and nitpick at the different flaws and uh, shortcomings that they see, that's a relationship that was meant to be a blessing and suddenly it will turn more into a burden. Or a congregation where members only gripe and uh, look for issues but never encourage and lift up one another. That's not going to be a place that people enjoy coming together to worship with. 
And that's why Paul warned in a passage like Galatians 5 and verse 15. What did he warn? But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And pettiness is very closely related to that idea of biting and devouring others. And so this is what makes pettiness such a serious issue. The damage it does not just to my life, but also to my relationships. That if I become a petty person, more than just a one-time incident, but how I conduct myself, how I behave, my relationships will suffer. At my job, with my family, with my spouse, but most importantly, with my God. And so this is a sin that we must deal with. But here's the best part. Why we started going over kindness Because that's the alternative. That's what we've been called to live by, and that's what we need to rise up to. And so it's simple. Don't be petty, but instead be kind to one another. But can I give you some suggestions to remove pettiness from our hearts and from our lives? Three three suggestions to remove pettiness from our lives. And, And the first is we need to look more closely at self. We need to look more closely at self. And I gave some examples earlier of some ways that we are so petty in our dealings with our relationships and with others that we get so frustrated, we get so worked up about the little things. And what I found with ways that I become petty and that I'm petty in my life is uh, just using an example that's not true. I always need to clarify, especially with Haley not being here, that you guys think that this is a real issue. Let's say I get really annoyed that, you know, she would just leave dirty dishes in the sink. We have a dishwasher for a reason. Why wouldn't she just put them in there? And that that just grinds my gears. And so every time I see it, it creates a spirit of criticism, a spirit of tension in our house because it bothers me. And so I have to let her know. But if I get so short-sighted and I get so focused on that issue that she's doing that, that bothers me that I don't realize, well, I'm the one that fails to close the lid on the toilet. I'm, seeing, I'm failing to see all the flaws that, that I do, all of my shortcomings because I'm so focused on what she's doing and why that is wrong. And that's a major part of pettiness and fault finding is that it's a failure to see my own flaws because we only see that of others. And so it's a very helpful thing. It's a very good thing that Jesus addresses this for us. Remember Matthew 7? A lot of times we stop at verse 1. One of the most quoted and most well-known passages in the Bible, but it is powerful in dealing with this topic. Topic of looking in at myself before I look out at others. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Again, this is is a very well-known passage and oftentimes a maybe abused passage. But Jesus gets at the idea of fault-finding and seeing the problems with others. For instance, when you're driving at night, Haley probably gets annoyed at me complaining about this. The cars on the other side of the road, I always say that they all have their high beams on. They always look so bright. And that's how it is. We, we, we can always see the problems in somebody else's life. That, that's so clear. That's so easy. It's so natural for us to do. But yet we fail to see the glaring issues in my own life. And Jesus tells us to pump the brakes. We need to slow down. That it's easy to see that small speck, that small issue, that second minor problem in somebody else's life and miss the first rate problem in your own. And that's what happened in John chapter 8. Remember in John chapter 8, the Pharisees were in such a rush to put Jesus to the test to find something that would stick against him. And so they find this woman that's caught in adultery and they throw her before him and they say, look, the law says the stone such a woman. What, What do you say that we do? And at first he doesn't respond. He's still drawing in the ground. But then when he does respond to them, he says in verse 7, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they leave. 
And we need to be careful that we're not spending so much time making a big issue of the small flaws of others that we miss the glaring problems in our own life. And that's what Jesus is helping us to see, helping us to do in Matthew chapter 7. To slow down. Something that I would always tell my soccer guys when I was coaching because 18 to 21 year olds love to point the finger at others. Whenever they'd say, well, you're doing this, you're doing that, I tell them every time you're pointing the finger, remember there's three pointing right back at you. And that's something we always need to be mindful of. And so to help me remove pettiness from my life and replace it with kindness, I need to slow down. I need to do a healthy self-examination. And there are so many other passages that I want to include on self-examination and looking inward and looking at myself. Rob was up here at the building earlier this week, and I was telling him what I was going to preach on Sunday. Texted him late Friday night and said, well, change of plans. Next week, I'm going to do a lesson on self-examination. So we're going to go into that in more detail. But that's such an important part of our lives as Christians, re-evaluating our hearts, re-evaluating our soul and our standing before God. But when we slow down, And we look at our lives, that should help us not only to be so critical of the mistakes, the minor mistakes of others, but hopefully to see our own deficiencies. Because I think if we're being honest and genuine with ourselves, I'm sure that we can find plenty of issues in our own life that will keep us busy for a little bit. And so first, let's start by removing, uh, by looking more closely at ourselves. But a second way that we can remove pettiness from our life is to simply look for the good. Look for the good in others and in situations that come up in our lives. Thomas Hardy was a famous writer in the late 1800s, and he said this, that if he went into a country field, he would always see not the wild flowers and their beauty, but the dung heap in the corner of the field. And my reason for including that is that fault finding is often the result of fault seeking. A failure to see the beauty in a situation because we're just constantly looking, constantly inspecting for the issues, for the problems, and we turn nothing into something. And this is something we need to be reminded of because the people that we have in our life, the relationships that we have, they're with people. And guess what? People aren't perfect. If you look hard enough, you're going to find problems because your spouse isn't perfect. Your your children aren't perfect. Your church family is not perfect. Your friends, they aren't perfect. And so guess what? There's bound to be problems that exist, bound to be problems that arise because people make mistakes. But Christians should be the type of people that we don't go into life with a critical eye for everything, looking for chances to criticize and jump on the the faults and shortcomings of others. Instead of looking for faults, why don't I just look for the good? And I'm preaching to myself because I realize I am so guilty of this. Something I did just a couple of weeks ago, probably about a month or two ago. We moved into our new house and we're trying to do some repairs on it and some fixes. And Haley wanted to repaint the cabinets. And so she repainted them from the off wood color to white. And I kind of stayed out of her way and let her do that. And, you know, she spent a lot of time, a lot of hours investing into this project, making it look good. And so I didn't look at it until it was mostly done. And she said, can you, can you come look at it? And some of you, you already know where this is going. I come out to the kitchen and I look at it and she's done a fantastic job. It's all white and it's like I'm almost done, like 95, 96% done. But what did I look at? the 4% that was remaining. You know, instead of starting, wow, this looks so good, this looks fantastic, look at all that you've done, I said, well, there's that spot right there. Are you going to do that? I messed that one up. It was a chance to see the good, but I missed it because all that I saw, all that I looked at was the bad. And we don't like people like that in our lives. They suck the air right out of us in our relationships. But when we do the opposite, instead of looking for the bad and we look for the good, that is a great way, an easy way for us to shine as light in a dark world. To be an optimistic, to be an uplifting people. Philippians 4 and verse 8 challenges us with it when it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You know, what are we spending our time concentrating? 
Well, where are we spending our mental energy and our focus at? Are we always allowing those minor problems to ruin our day? Is that what we're glancing at? Is that what we're seeing? And so then the challenge for us from Philippians 4 and verse 8 is the condition and train our mind to think like this. And that's not an easy thing to do, but I hope that we can always look for the good. Removing those petty inklings that come our way. Setting our minds on things above. And lastly, we'll end with this. Third way that we can remove pettiness from our life is we need to encourage rather than criticize. I want us to do more than just simply see the good, but take the time to build others up. Don't ever minimize the importance of what a single word, a single encouraging phrase can do in the life of another. From Acts chapter 13 and through chapter 20, you see a trend in those chapters. If you have a Bible app, which I know a lot of you do, and you search the word encourage or encouragement, from Acts 13 through 20 in those chapters, you're going to see that word appear almost several times in every single chapter. And that becomes to be a trend as Paul is going out on these missionary journeys and being with all these new converts and these new Christians and teaching people what they needed was encouragement and what he got in some cases was encouragement from them. And that goes such a far way. That what would he have done if he would have gone around all these New Testament Christians, these babes in Christ, and just said, Where, where's your suit at? Why, why aren't you dressed properly? You know, why, why aren't you doing all these things? And I say that sarcastically, please understand. Well, what, what if he just went in there with a critical eye on all these different issues that were occurring? Probably wouldn't have lasted. But instead, he went in and he built them up. Acts 14 and verse 22, encouraging them to continue in the faith. Acts 16 and verse 14, uh, 40, encouraging the Philippians. Or maybe you remember Joseph. Not the Genesis Joseph or Joseph, the, the father of Jesus, but another Joseph. But that's not how we remember him. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 36, his name is called Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. We aren't told how he got that nickname, but I have a speculation. How do people get nicknames today? Oftentimes by how they live their life, by the type of person that they are. I mentioned that in a lesson before, and somebody said, well, actually, people sometimes get nicknames because of the opposite of how they are. Like a really big person might be called Tiny. And I said, that's true, but I'm going to go with my version for Barnabas and hope that's the case. But, you know, I, I don't think it's a stretch. To say that Barnabas was given this name from the type of man that he was. And so I hope we can be a people that are quick and ready to give out compliments and find things that are praiseworthy, to think on those things, but say that to others, to lift them up, to edify them. Again, one of the ways that we define kindness is that it's pleasant. You want to be around those type of people. But that also means that the inverse is true. Those that are petty, those are the type of people you don't want to be around. So maybe instead of saying that your wife's cooking was just a little bit off tonight, not that we would ever do that, why would you not just thank her for taking the time to cook? Instead of telling the elders a trivial matter like how you think we we just need new carpet, we have to get new carpet, when's the last time we've praised them and encouraged them in the job that they're doing? Maybe instead of commenting to your family in the car after worship how the song leader, he missed a beat, and the song was just a little flat, why not talk about the lyrics that you were singing in reverence and praise to God? Instead of commenting on how God isn't doing this, he's not doing that, he's not acting fast enough, why not lift our God up, extol him for the God that he is, that we can be forgiven from a sin like pettiness? Brethren, we're called to be a kind people, and that is a simple word, but it's not a simple life. Colossians 3 and verse 12 tells us it's something that we must put on. And so I hope that this lesson is encouraging to us, that it helps us to not be content to be a petty people, but in an attempt to make us a kind people, exhibiting the same attributes that we see of our God and our Savior. You know, typically we would offer up the invitation at the end of a lesson, and we don't have an invitation song, but we still want to make sure that invitation is known, that if there's some here that maybe you've been studying on your own, and you've come to believe who Jesus is, and you're ready to begin a covenant relationship with him, we'd be more than happy to assist you in that. Or maybe you just, you're searching, and you need some answers, you need some help, we'd be more than happy to study with you in that effort as well. Appreciate your kind, your time and attention this morning.